The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, today I'm going to uh, set up the uh, effective Hamiltonian matrices for doublet pi and doublet sigma states and the interactions between them. And uh, so this involves looking at all of the, the usual operators that you're going to encounter in uh, the Hamiltonian for diatomic molecules. So suppose you have a problem. Uh, and the problem is doublet pi and doublet sigma states. The first thing you do is you list all the basis functions. And so for a doublet pi state, you have lambda is 1, s is a half, and so we have uh, lambda sigma omega 1, 1 half, 3 halves, 1 minus a half, 1 half, minus 1, 1 half, minus a half, and minus one, minus a half, minus three halves. So there are four basis functions for a doublet pi state. And so it's always a good idea when you're facing a problem to make a list of all the actors. And uh, so this will be called doublet pi three halves. This will be called doublet pi one half. This will be called doublet pi minus a half, and this is double pi minus three halves. And we can dress them up with, as bras and uh, as kets. And so these are the basis functions, and we're going to be wanting to evaluate matrix elements of the terms in the Hamiltonian. And uh, the Hamiltonian, the effective Hamiltonian, contains the rotational term and the spin orbit term and other fine structure terms, but let's just put in electronic, vibrational, and then fine structure, fine. And so what we're going to want to do is look at all of these terms and write down the, the matrix that describes the Hamiltonian for a double pi state. Then we'll do the same thing for a doublet sigma state and the interaction between double pi and doublet sigma. And we'll, we'll learn by going through these, uh, these examples. OK, so the rotational Hamiltonian from last time is B of R times J minus L minus S squared. And so this can be rewritten as j squared minus jz squared plus s squared minus sc squared uh, plus l perpendicular squared. And those are the diagonal elements. And then we have the off diagonal elements minus uh, 2 j dot l minus 2 j dot s and plus 2 l dot s. Okay, so we have, we have all of these operators that we're going to have to look at and we're operating, we have the basis functions omega jm, uh, lambda s sigma, and we know what all of these things do. These are diagonal operators. This is, we're just going to pretend this is a constant that we throw away somewhere. And there's going to be some, uh, some off diagonal stuff that goes, in. in fact, I've actually cheated. I've written something that's wrong. Uh, so 
um, let me just correct that. Um, let me rewrite this line. So we're going to, we're going to have uh, minus j plus l minus plus j minus l plus minus j plus s. Uh, you see, I'm doing it again. I'm putting, the, uh, putting them up rather than down. The, I'm just wired that way. But I, you know, I, I said for body fixed components, you want to, to have lowercase symbols and you want to put the plus and minus at the bottom. I'm just, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to continue with this because if I, if I correct it once, then I'll correct, I'll just make the same mistake again later. So, um, Okay, so we have the diagonal elements and we have the off-diagonal elements. This simplification came from writing, uh, knowing that R was perpendicular, we had an Rx squared uh, Let me just make sure I'm doing this right. We wanted to uh, yeah. So R, R squared was like this, and we ended up. I better. I better be careful. Uh, uh, so we we had operators had that had the form uh, J squared minus J Z squared uh, because we had J X squared plus J Y squared. And we, we made this replacement. So that was, OK. So I, I've got it right. And uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate matrix elements in that basis set over there of these operators. OK, so uh, the best way, the way I recommend filling out a matrix is just saying, OK, we've got doublet pi, 3 halves, uh, Hamiltonian, doublet pi, 3 halves. We want, we want the, uh, the term that goes in here. We, have, we write the two basis functions that we're interested in. And then we ask, well, OK, what are the terms in the Hamiltonian that are going to have non-zero matrix elements between these two basis functions? And that will be uh, the We'll have uh, electronic plus vibrational plus that di this diagonal part, j squared minus j z squared. And that's all. OK, and so what goes in this uh, double pi 3 halves Double pi, three halves. Well, in fact, let's let's label the matrix like this. Double pi, three halves. Double pi, one half. Double pi, minus a half. Double pi, minus three halves. And we'll. It's going to be a matrix. Double pi, three halves. Double pi, one half. Double pi, minus a half. Double pi, minus three halves. So we're going to be filling in a table like this. So what's going to go here? Well, let's forget about the electronic plus vibrational. Those, that's going to appear everywhere in the same way. And let's not write B anymore, because what we really care about is what, what happens with this stuff. OK, is that all right? Everybody is comfortable? So what we want to know is what matrix elements go in each of the positions. Well, j squared always gives us jj plus 1. And I'm going to call that x, so I don't have to write so much. x is equal to j, j plus 1. And then jz squared, well, that's going to give us omega squared. And omega is 3 halves, 
So that's going to be minus 9 fourths. S squared is SS plus 1, which is 1 half times 3 halves, 3 fourths. And minus SC is going to be a half squared, so that will be minus a fourth. Okay, and uh, for the diagonal element that goes here, we're going to have an x minus, now not 9 halves, but uh, not 9 fourths, but 1 fourth, 3 halves, 3, three quarters minus 1 fourth. Okay, so the SS plus 1 is always going to be 3 halves, 3 fourths. And whether you have sigmas one half or minus a half, you're always going to get a minus a fourth here. Okay, and now for the doublet pi minus a half, well, that's going to be exactly the same as this. Because it do, we have an omega squared, it doesn't matter whether it's omega is plus a half or minus a half. Uh, it doesn't care. <laughs> And so everything is the same. So this, this combination of symbols is x uh, plus a quarter. I'm, yes, x plus a quarter. All right, and this combination of symbols is x minus 7 quarters. Okay. So we've done the diagonal elements. Now let's look at the off-diagonal elements. The off-diagonal elements, what is the operator that takes us between doublet pi 3 halves and doublet pi 1 half? Well, well what's the operator that's going to do that? Well, uh, we have lambdas 1 on uh, both locations. We have sigma is a half here and sigma is a minus a half here. So that has to be minus J S and now the sigma is minus a half so that means we need sigma plus J minus. S plus J minus. Okay? And so now what, what matrix element do we get from this? Well, from that we're going to get JJ plus 1, because the matrix elements, uh, we could have a minus sign, because there's a minus sign there. Uh, the matrix elements of J minus are what? If we have omega JM, J minus, omega J, oops, uh, J minus is, is a raising operator. So, so this is, these are the matrix elements we want that are non-zero. What do we get? Well, matrix elements of J plus and J minus are J, J plus 1 minus omega, omega minus 1. So whenever you have a raising and lowering operator, it's going to be a magnitude minus the product of the two different values of the projection, total thing, uh, everything square rooted. So we, the procedure we're using is we write down the basis functions. We ask which operators can take us between those basis functions. And then we know what the matrix elements are going to be because basically all you have is the z component and the plus and minus one component, the plus and minus components, and you're just hardwired. You know, you, there's nothing to remember. Okay, so uh, so what goes here? Well, we're going to have jj plus one minus uh, th this combination of omegas. Omega is three halves and 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 one half, so we're going to have three fourths. And so we're going to have JJ plus 1, X minus 3 fourths, uh, X minus 3 fourths. Uh, 
square root. And now what about the other term? The other term, we have, you know, what, what goes here is j, uh, j plus s minus. And s minus is taking you, so we have uh, s minus, and we have a sigma is uh, one half sigma of minus a half. And so what are we going to get? We're going to get an SS plus 1, which is 3 fourths, minus the product of omegas, which is my, uh, minus uh, a fourth, so we'll get plus a fourth square root. Well, that's just one good thing, too. Uh, and so off diagonal, we get an x minus 3 quarters. On the diagonal, we get an x plus a quarter, an x minus 7 quarters. And uh, what else do we have in here? Well, suppose we're trying to go between here and here. Omega equals 3 halves, omega equals minus a half. That's changing omega by 2, 0. You can't change omega by 2. You can only change it by 0 plus and minus 1. And here you can't change it by 3. So when you when you do all of this, what you find is we have two identical blocks of the Hamiltonian. And uh, uh, so let me just write this in a more wonderful form. We have an x plus a quarter. x plus a quarter is j, j plus 1, plus 1 fourth. That's the same thing as j plus a half squared. And this x minus 7 fourths is the same thing as uh, uh, this one here is going to be j plus, a j plus a half squared minus 2. And this here uh, is going to be uh, j uh, J, J plus 1. So this, this, I want a square root of something that's going to come out nice. So we have uh, J, J plus 1 minus three quarters, and that's going to be the same thing as j plus a half uh, squared minus one. Don't like that. Okay, so we have, uh, we put, uh, um, Well, let's just, let's just write as minus three-fourths. Okay, square root. Sorry. So we have two blocks that are identical. They're expressed in the, uh, I was expecting something to, nicer to come out, and I, I think I made an algebraic mistake because, uh, well, you'll see. Okay, so we've, we've expressed the doublet pi uh, matrix for um, for the rotational part, and now we, what we want to start doing is look at some of the other operators, and then we'll be we'll have all of the cards on the table. Okay, so the rotational Hamiltonian has the L uncoupling. as well as the S uncoupling term. We've, this, this is a matrix element of the S uncoupling part of the rotational Hamiltonian. Now L uncoupling mixes doublet pi with doublet sigma. It changes lambda. It spoils the lambda quantum number. And so uh, we're going to want to worry about matrix elements 
of the L uncoupling term. So suppose we have a doublet pi state and a doublet sigma state, and uh, uh, the L uncoupling operator is going to change uh, lambda, and since it changes lambda by one, it has to change omega by one. And so let's say this is lambda plus one, this is lambda zero, so we're going to have uh, L plus J minus that goes in here. Remember J minus is a raising operator and it's going to take us from omega one half to omega three halves. All right. So, um, and we ought to put this B of R in here because now we have two different electronic states and we can't just replace B of R by the rotational constant of one state. We're going to have to evaluate some off-diagonal matrix element of this operator for the vibrational wave function here and the vibrational wave function here. So let's stick a B pi V sigma. Okay, so what we get is uh, B pi B of R B sigma times this matrix element of these two things. We have two operators in here and uh, uh, we know what J minus does and so we're going to get a J, J plus one minus the, two, the product of the two omegas, three halves and one half. I am not really follow, I'm sort of following the notes but I'm not doing it the way it's done in the notes. So we have three halves, one half square root. And then we have this uh, matrix element of L plus and unfortunately since L is not a good quantum number we can't just write this as LL plus one minus the, the two different lambdas. So what we do is we write it as a symbol. Uh, we, we write it as pi uh, L plus sigma and we call that, uh, we call that beta. It's a number that we're going to have to evaluate by fitting to the spectrum. We cannot evaluate this matrix element, but we have to be careful with it. Because we do not know that, uh, I mean, we have lambda of one, L plus, uh, lambda of zero. We don't know that lambda of minus one, L minus lambda of zero. What is the relationship between these two symbols? It looks sort of obvious that they should be the same, but they're not. And we're going we're gonna to go through uh, how do we manipulate these symbols using things we do know uh, next time. But you, you can see that for the operators we do know, if we change the signs of all of the projection quantum numbers, nothing changes. But here, when we change the sign or, and change, the, uh, change from L plus to L minus, you don't know whether this is going to be, these are going to be equal or one is going to be minus the other. And let me tell you, it makes all the difference in the world because you will get the wrong results. You will find that this, if you do it wrong, you will get off-diagonal matrix elements between states of different parity, which you know is wrong. But that's, getting ahead, that's putting the cart before the horse. Okay, so we have this rotational part of the Hamiltonian it gives rise to a part of the matrix within a state that we can write down without thinking. And then it gives rise to off-diagonal matrix elements between different multiplet states, which part of which we can evaluate. And it multiplies something that's an unknown constant about which we have to be careful. Okay. All right, so now there are other terms in the Hamiltonian that we're going to look at 
to add to this mix of calculating matrix elements. And as I said, there are two important terms that you care about. One is the rotational Hamiltonian, one is spin orbit. And so let's spend some time talking about spin orbit. Now I tell you that the spin orbit Hamiltonian ought to be treated as this operator, sum over i, where this is uh, spin orbitals. What's a spin orbital? Suppose you have a pi orbital. Lambda is either 1 or minus 1, and spin is either, uh, or the projection of spin, sigma, is plus, one, plus a half or minus a half. So you have, you have four symbols associated with pi. One alpha, one beta, minus one alpha, minus one beta. So this is the magnitude of lambda for the, the, the orbital, and this is whether the spin is up or down. So this symbol, which is an orbital, is equivalent to these four symbols, which are spin orbitals. And when we write the wave function, we're going to write uh, a Slater determinant of spin orbitals, and eventually I'll teach you how to evaluate matrix element in the spin orbital basis. But uh, we have to be careful that what the symbol is, and these are the actual things. Now, here is an operator that's written in the form that it's designed to operate on these sorts of things. And we'd like to avoid having to do that unless we have to. And so what we want to do is replace this form of the spin orbit operator with something that is more convenient so that we can work in the lambda sigma basis rather than in the one electron spin orbital basis. We always know we can go to this basis to uh, uh, check to see we did, did something right or to evaluate uh, molecular matrix elements in terms of atomic matrix elements. But that's something that I'll get to in a few lectures. So what we want to do is we want to take this operator and replace it by something that is more convenient to use for a limited set of situations. And this brings us to the Wigner Eckhart theorem. Now, there is a elaborate form of the Wigner Eckhart theorem that says matrix elements of any uh, operator classified as in terms of its tensorial, tensorial character can be expressed in terms of uh, Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Uh, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We want to instead say, okay, we're going to take a limited and convenient form of the Wigner Eckhart theorem that we can always use, which is incredibly convenient. So suppose you have a situation where uh, the projection quantum number does not change. Not the projection, the magnitude quantum number. So for spin orbit, we can say, let's consider the subset of cases where delta s is equal to zero. And we can also consider the, uh, the situation where delta l is equal to zero, but we don't that doesn't really mean anything because l is ill-defined. But OK, whenever you have a, uh, an operator which is, uh, so suppose you have an op. Let's see what I have in my notes. Um, how do I do this? Oh. 
Where do I talk about the Wigner-Eckhart theorem of light? Oh, th there it is, okay. So, suppose we have an operator B, which is a, a vector with respect to A. And so, remember, last time I told you, we classify operators as vectors or scalars based on the commutation rules. So, we have, we know that this operator B is a, a vector with respect to A. Well, that means if we're interested in situations where delta B, the projection quantum number is zero, then we can replace B by some constant times A. So we have the classifying operator, the operator for which we know all the matrix elements. This is an operator that we've used to define our basis set. It is a very, very nice thing to be able to simplify uh, uh, the algebra by replacing the operator by a constant times another operator. So what we do for the spin orbit, where is the spin orbit? Where did I put, here it is. Yes. This, this is a vector, this is a component of L. L is the sum of the little l. We can define L as sum i of little l's. So this operator is obviously a vector with respect to big L. And so we can replace this by some constant, uh, um, let's just use, I want to use C times big L. And this little s, this one electron s, is a vector with respect to big S. So we can replace this by d s. So now we have c d l dot s. So we can take this thing and replace it this is inconvenient because its operators don't operate on our basis functions. We would have to do some work to use it. We can replace this by, an opera by operators that do operate in our basis set. And so for the s simplifying case, delta S is equal to zero, we replace spin orbit by A L dot S. This is the Simple, a simplified form of the spin orbit, which is only valid within a, uh, with it, without changing s. This is not the general spin orbit, because the general spin orbit operator does change s. But this is convenient because we know what to do with this operator in our basis set. And there are all sorts of cases when you have an operator which is expressed in a microscopic form, where you would have to write, rewrite your, uh, your basis functions in terms of spin orbitals. And that's not all that hard, but it's inconvenient. And this is really nice because uh, for, for this form, we have L dot S, which is uh, L Z S Z plus one half, L plus S minus plus L minus S plus. And this is what, we appear, what appears on the, uh, in the multiplet Hamiltonian. We say spin orbit is A L Z S Z. It en enables us to write the spin orbit matrix elements within a multiplet state in a really simple form. But it's not, you know, it's, it's a lie. Um, and it also enables us to write the spin orbit matrix elements between two different electronic states, say a doublet pi state and a doublet sigma state. Again, we're going to have a constant 
And we're we can't evaluate this in full, but we do have these things. If you look at this form of the operator, it says the selection rule is delta s equals zero. This is not true for the spin orbit, but it's true for this reduction. That was the assumption we made in reducing it. So there are countless cases where you want to write an operator replacement to make your life easier. And this constant here is called a, a reduced matrix element. And sometimes you just evaluate it against the, uh, the energy levels in the spectrum, or sometimes you evaluate it by doing more complicated things. OK, so I told you about how we reduce the uh, uh, spin orbit operator to something that's convenient. And so within the doublet pi state, we just have L A, A L Z S Z. And so what is that going to be? The possible values for that are going to be for doublet pi three halves. It'll be A times one times a half, right? Uh, for doublet pi three halves, lambda is one, sigma is a half. And for doublet pi one half, it'll be A times one times minus a half. For double pi minus a half, it'll be the same thing. For double pi minus three halves, it'll be this. And so what we see is the spin orbit contribution is going to be, uh, now I'm committing a crime because I have factored B out, but what will happen here is we'll have uh, minus A over two and plus a over 2. OK, and nothing, no contributions off diagonal, same, same things over here. OK, there are other operators that we often uh, include in our effective Hamiltonian. And those would be spin, spin, and spin rotation. So I'm not even going to write down the microscopic forms of these things. I'm going to say we have an operator replacement for them, which comes out to be 2 thirds lambda times 3 SZ squared minus S squared. That's the, that's the form of the spin-spin operator that we use. It's an operator replacement for something more complicated. We know that because these, uh, these uh, the matrix elements, uh, the selection rule for matrix elements of this operator is delta S equals 0. And the full spin-spin has delta S equals plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2. But we can't evaluate those sorts of matrix elements with this form of the operator. But this is the form we want because it operates within a multiplet state, which is always what we're, almost always what we care about. We want to be able to write the Hamiltonian for this group of states that are close together, a lambda S multiplet. And so we commit all sorts of crimes in order to be able to do that without thinking. OK, and for this one, we have gamma, the spin rotation constant, times uh, r dot s, spin rotation. But r is not convenient, and so we write j minus l minus s dot s. So we get gamma j dot s minus l dot s minus s squared. And that's the form of the spin rotation Hamiltonian we're going to use. This one is easy. This is purely diagonal. This one has exactly the same form as the spin orbit operator we just derived. 
And this one has exactly the same form as the spin rota the, the S uncoupling term for the rotational Hamiltonian. So all this does is it dresses up the matrix in a way that we, uh, we can anticipate in this too. Okay, so it's, it's an easy thing to work out the matrix elements of spin spin and spin rotation and add that to the rotation plus spin orbit matrix. Okay, uh, so as a homework assignment, let's, let's take a sextet delta state. That's really mean. And include uh, rotation, spin orbit, spin spin, and spin rotation. Okay, so uh, sextet delta, that means uh, uh, we have uh, S is equal to uh, three halves is five halves, five halves. So uh, um, there's going to be a slight problem because if S is equal to five halves, we could have delta minus a half two different ways. We can have lambda equals uh, two, sigma equals minus five halves. Okay, that gives us a delta, uh, an omega minus a half. Or we can have uh, um, um, So lambda can only be two or minus two, and and so we can have sigma equals plus three halves. So we can get omega minus a half two different ways. So you just have to find a notation that works for you. You see, two minus five halves is minus a half. Minus two plus three halves is minus a half. These are different states. They have the same omega, and uh, in, in your sextet delta state, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have the highest omega is going to be uh, 2 plus 5 halves is uh, uh, 9 halves, 7 halves, 5 halves, 3 halves, 1 half, minus a half. So there's going to be six spin orbit components. And they are going to be spread out roughly equally as far as the spin orbit splitting is concerned. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff. Okay? And it, it, it's really, it should be fun because, you know, you have these simple operators and uh, there's a lot of redundancy and there are a lot of zeros in this matrix. And uh, you won't find it, well, actually, you will find it in Haugen. I just realized he did do sextet delta as a problem, but probably not in a form that you will find uh, sufficiently detailed. So I recommend working that out. Now, what time is it? OK, so. I'm confused about something from the Yes. Why does, for the pi state, why does lambda have to be plus or minus one? Um, zero projection. Well, but remember, uh, where, did, where, did, where did we get lambda s states? We, remember, we started with an L, an atomic L. So we have an atomic state, and it has ls states. And we bring up a, a something that spoils spherical symmetry. It applies an electric field that's on the order of uh, a million volts per centimeter. So what that does is it mixes all of the different LS states in a way that has delta m sub L is equal to zero. So 
L is wiped out, and we get now separate states with different values of M spell for this, which is lambda for the molecule. So the states that are together are states which, which have the same value of lambda. And a state that has lambda equals zero, or uh, you know, here's lambda plus and minus one, here's lambda equals zero. These are different electronic states. And, and so if you're uh, interested in writing the Hamiltonian for a particular uh, lambda s electronic state, multiplet state, uh, it, you're no longer thinking about taking a, a projection quantum number, an angular momentum, and, uh, and adjusting its projection on the body axis. We've destroyed L. It's gone. There's just these two states that are degenerate because uh, the Stark effect doesn't lift the degeneracy of, two, of, M, of positive and negative M sub L. So when you, 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 you put a big electric field onto an atom, you destroy L, you conserve M sub L, but you don't lift the degeneracy of, uh, of M sub L, positive and negative. So that other state, would that be called a sigma state? That would be a sigma state, yes. Okay. So I could have answered you in a much different way. So, uh, no, that, that was helpful. Okay, so. So the delta state only has uh, lambda, lambda equals plus, plus two minus. and minus two. Okay. And, but it has all of the sigmas, because so, you know, the, the breaking of spherical symmetry in coordinate space doesn't do anything to spin space. So we, we have these six components, and uh, uh, you will find uh, um, you know, th that uh, uh, th they will the matrix is going to be tridiagonal, and uh, um, so this is the di main diagonal. This is one off the diagonal delta omega equals one, delta omega minus one, and uh, everything else is zero. And uh, okay. So this is sort of a logical stopping point. Let me just see if there's anything that's worth talking about now. Um, I think uh, I think we should stop. I, I mean, I, there's I, I've done everything in the notes, perhaps not as beautifully as it's written out in the notes, and uh, uh, I've given you a problem where you'll be able to to wrestle with all of this, and you're, you should be, you, you should consider it fortunate that I haven't asked you to do the sextet delta sextet pi off diagonal interaction, at least not yet. Okay? So, I'll see you tomorrow morning, and I'll resolve this, uh, this ambiguity about uh, these kinds of matrix elements, and how do you figure out whether they are equal to each other or minus one times each other.